Okay, for those interested, uh, again, tonight's, uh, this is uh, the Zoom meeting for tonight's, for the regularly, for the regular town council meeting for February 22nd, 2021. The meeting will start at seven o'clock. If you want to participate in public comment, I need you guys to raise your hands now. That doesn't mean literally hold your hand to your camera. That means to use the uh, uh, raise hand function built in the Zoom platform. Uh, the tutorial about, uh, I'm about to show two tutorials. The first tutorial will show you how to use our closed captions, which are available now. Um, and the second tutorial will go over the meeting and how to use the raise hand feature. So without further ado, let's start off with the uh, closed caption tutorial. How to enable live captions in Zoom using otter.ai. To enable live captioning in Zoom using Otter's AI-powered voice-to-text service in an open Zoom meeting, first click the on otter.ai drop-down menu and select view stream on otter.ai. This will bring need to sign up for or log into an Otter account to use this service. Exiting out of the sign up window will bring a full screen view of the Zoom live captions in Zoom using otter.ai. To enable live captioning in Zoom using Otter's AI powered voice to text service in an open Zoom meeting, first click the on otter.ai drop down menu and select view stream on otter.ai. This will bring up a new window in your primary browser. A sign-up window will appear in the center of your screen. To get to the meeting text, simply exit out of the sign-up window. You do not need to sign up for or log into an Otter account to use this service. Exiting out of the sign-up window will bring a full screen view of the Zoom meeting's text in your browser window. To enable a side screen view of the text adjacent to the Zoom meeting window, click the sidebar button here. You will then need to tab over to the Zoom window to return to viewing the Zoom meeting. If your Zoom meeting window is either maximized or set to full screen, click the floating window button in the top right of your screen to make the Zoom window a floating window. If you are not satisfied with the window layout of the Zoom meeting, now that the window is floating, you may reposition the window by clicking and dragging the white space atop the Zoom meeting window. And you may resize the window by hovering your mouse over any edge or corner of the Zoom meeting window, making sure to wait for the cursor to change from an arrow cursor to a resizing cursor, and then clicking and dragging the window edges to the size of your liking. As a reminder, you can switch between speaker view and gallery view by clicking the button of the same name in the top right corner of the Zoom video viewing screen. Please note that during a live meeting, the Otter side window captioning will auto scroll only so long as the user does not manually scroll in that window. If, for example, you decide to scroll back to an earlier part of the meeting, in order to re-enable auto scrolling, you will have to exit out of the Otter windows and reopen them as was done at the beginning of this video. Thanks for watching this tutorial and enjoy the meeting. Okay, I'm not sure why Zoom is resizing my video here. Um, all right, so this is going to now be the tutorial for the meeting itself. Here we go. Your Zoom meeting administrator for tonight's town council meeting. The meeting will begin at 7 p.m. Eastern. Before the meeting starts, I've put together this brief instructional video to help you get better acquainted with the Zoom meetings platform and how this virtual town council meeting will operate. Before we get started, we would like to kindly ask non-council participants to please keep your audio and video muted throughout unless called upon. As you are brought into the meeting, for example, from a waiting room, you will have the momentary ability to unmute your video. We kindly ask that you refrain from doing so, and each participant's video will be manually muted upon entry one at a time. 
If you do not want to see non-video participants, hover your mouse over a non-video participant video image. Click these three dots highlighted in blue and select hide non-video participants. If you want to see all the councilmen at the same time, rather than focusing only on the councilman who is speaking, select gallery view in the top right corner of the viewing panel. If you would like to participate in public comment, you must first raise your hand and you'll be added to the list of public comment participants on a first come first serve basis until the meeting's commencement at 7 p.m. When we say raise your hand, we don't mean literally hold your hand up to the camera. To raise your hand, first make sure the participants panel is open at the right of your screen. You can open the participants panel by clicking participants icon at the bottom of your screen. Once the participants panel is open, to raise your hand, select raise hand in the bottom right corner of the participants panel. For telephone only participants, to raise your hand, press star nine on your telephone touchpad. I will be taking names for public comment as soon as this video finishes, and at the mayor's request, we'll be calling on participants for public comment on a first come, first serve basis. Once you're called upon, I will send out a request to unmute yourself as you will be self-muted upon entry. To unmute yourself in desktop, click the unmute icon in the bottom left corner of the viewing panel and which looks like a microphone with the red slash through it or simply select unmute in the request message. For telephone only participants, press star six to mute or unmute yourself. Once you've been unmuted for public comment, you'll have five minutes to address the council. Time will be kept by the acting sergeant at arms. We'll alert you when you have one minute left. When your time has expired, the sergeant at arms will let you know, and I will then mute you at either the mayor's request or at the request of the sergeant at arms. I will only act upon their instruction throughout the meeting and will neither mute nor unmute except upon entry any participant otherwise. For the record, as a Zoom meeting administrator, I will not be an active participant in the meeting. This means once the meeting is started, my camera and microphone will be muted unless otherwise called upon by either the mayor or the sergeant at arms. The final request before this video ends is to please be aware of your surroundings. Please be aware of background noise, such as dogs barking, children yelling, or a nearby fan blowing, visible background activity, and potential feedback from your microphone picking up the sound from your speakers. It is for this reason that we highly recommend the use of headphones. Thank you for watching. The meeting will begin at 7 p.m. And if you would like to participate in public comment, raise your hands now and do not put them down until called upon for public comment after the meeting has commenced. All right, so um, right now I have Harold's hand raised. Michael, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you, Michael. And uh, can, I, can I please be made a co-host? I'm sorry, pardon? Uh, somebody who has hosting privilege, can I please be made a co-host? Sure. Thank you. Oh, Pete's there. He can do it. You're done. How's that? Good evening, Walter. It's Chris. Good evening. How are we doing, Chris? Great. How are you? Uh, living the dream in a bubble on the mountain here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Walter. A white, a white frozen mountain. Is that Miss Katie? Yeah. Well, Miss Katie, I have been vaccinated to the hill. I'm All good right. to go. Good Excellent. for you. Excellent. Ah, pleased about it. Very pleased. So it's a beautiful snowstorm we had this afternoon, isn't it, out there? Uh, I tell you, it got a little bit ugly on the mountain here. But it's pretty. It's, yeah. <laughs> yep. Got to look at the bright side, Walter. Uh, that's true. It was uh, bright and white. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very pretty. Well, I'm glad you got vaccinated. Uh, so am I. I am thrilled. What is going on? Oh, there you are. Good evening, Mayor. Hey, Katie. How are you? I'm fine. A little frazzled getting on here, but otherwise fine. How are you? Thanks. Good. Hi, Mary Jane. Hi, how are you? Good. Hi, Chris. Katie. 
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Now, Mike Nahum um, will not be here this evening. Is Stephanie with us? Stephanie doing our minutes. Man, we can't do much without Stephanie. Yeah. Well, for the record, Mike Nahum said he wouldn't be unable to make it. He's out of town. Well, I think without Stephanie, we don't have a record. It's recorded. <laughs> oh, true. <laughs> yep. Ten, Doug. Hey, Doug. Hmm. Oops. Hello, Mike. Hey, Pete. I have no idea what's going on with my video, folks. So, no. Hi, David. Hey. Hello. How are you? Hey, David. Hey, hey Michael. Doug, I think I saw you there. All right, I got seven o'clock um, and I have three hands raised. I have uh, Jennifer, I saw that your hand was raised earlier. Um, so I have you first, Harold second, and Joe Q third. So last call to raise your hands before I hand this over to Pete. And Mike, did we do again the uh, tutorial on the closed caption? Yes, we did. Um, I'm awesome. having problems with my video tonight. So if it came in weird, I apologize. Perfect. And this is being recorded. Okay. All right. Uh, three hands. Meeting is yours. Okay. Uh, we would like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Doug, could you lead us in the pledge? Pledge. Doug, if you could lead us to the pledge. Maybe he's muted. Maybe he's muted. Okay, Katie, could you lead us? Of off? course. I <laughs> pledge allegiance to the flag, flag. flag. of the United, United States, States of America, of America and, to and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God, God indivisible, indivisible with liberty, with liberty and, and justice, justice for all. For all. We can have a moment of silence. The men and women in the armed forces, our first responders, and those that have passed from COVID-19. Thank you. Pete, can I just check? I've got Walter, uh, Mike Gold, Dave Lawson, Chris Cosgrove, Mary Jane, Katie, Doug, am I missing anybody? Mike, did you get Mike Gold? Yeah, I got my gold. Looks like Tom is just coming on. Dave Lawson, Mary Jane, and Tom should be coming. There yep. he is. Um, no Mike Nahum yet? No, he's out tonight. Okay. Okay. Mike, can we start with a public comment? All right, uh, Jennifer, I'm sending you your invitation to unmute. Oh, things bounce around on me here, Jennifer. Uh, there's your invitation. Can you guys hear me? Am I unmuted? No, nope. yeah, we got you now, Doug. Thank you. Mike, we can circle back to Jennifer. Do you want to go to the next one? All right, we will come back to Jennifer. Her Harold, I have you next. Hello? We can hear hey, you. Harold. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk about uh, discrepancies in uh, road reconstruction projects. Um, I have personally measured the following discrepancies in road reconstruction projects done in 2019 and 2020 uh, construction seasons. Road cross slope, 
The standard cross slope for a road in Connecticut is a 2% minimum and a 3% max. Carmen Hill number two, uh, I've measured cross slopes as steep as 8% in several locations. Fordyce Road has a section with a negative 0.5% cross slope. Mist Hill Road has a significant section of road with zero cross slope. I requested uh, what is the tolerance of acceptability for road cross slope from the Milford Public Works over a year ago, and I'm still waiting for a response. Catch basin cross slope. The vast majority of Connecticut DOT type C catch basins are installed with approximately a 6% cross slope. But more than 90% of these basins are located in the shoulder of, of the road, which is not typically driven on by traffic. The type C catch basins used by New Milford Public Works are different than the DOT basins. <clears throat> Through information requests, I was told by New Milford Public Works Department personnel that they're trying to install catch basins with approximately a 6% cross slope grade. I personally think this is a ridiculous waste because these catch basin tops are designed to be installed with the grate matching the cross slope of the road, especially since most of the catch basins in the town of New Milford roads are located within the driven portion of the road. Catch basin cross slopes I've measured on Carmen Hill number two vary from 17 to 16%. Catch basin cross slopes on Hecock Crossbrook Road vary from 1% to nearly 18%. If New Mulford Public Works requests catch basins to be installed with a 6% cross slope, why do they accept such huge amount of variation? I certainly don't think that's acceptable. Pavement surface tolerance. Connecticut DOT paving specification has a measured, measured metric for paving. No deviations more than quarter inch in 10 feet uh, on a 10 foot straight edge for the surface course of pavement, no more than three eighths of an inch deviation in 10 feet for all other pave, pavement courses. Our previous New Milford Public Works director or town engineer rewrote the paving specification to remove that measured metric in uh, was either 2018 or 2019. Our new New Milford Public Works personnel have not reinstated the pavement surface tolerance metric. How do you increase quality of road paving by removing an important measured metric for quality assurance, quality control? Are the New Milford taxpayers actually getting the world-class roads which we were promised? That's all I have to say. The, Harold, uh, Harold what's your last name? Hill. And your address, please? 66, and your address, North, please? 66 North Road, New Mulford, Connecticut. Thank you. I'll be, uh, I'll be emailing uh, uh, my, uh, my speech uh, uh, to the town council and mayor shortly. So if you can please, uh, you know, utilize them. That's it. Thank you, Harold. Mike? Yep. Uh, do you want to come back to Jennifer? Yes, let's see if she can open. All right, Jennifer, it looks like you are unmuted. I'm going to ask you to start video. If you'd like to start video, then you can do that too. All right, so anyway, you got to let me tell Kelly where I went. So. Okay. Right. Hello, everybody. All right, let me do it. Um, can anybody hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, Jennifer. Yep. Hey, I have my daughter here with me. She'll help me share a because I can hear and I'm not able to understand. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Please bear with me. I'm trying to pull up my nose to see if it can record with a microphone so that I can see the subtitles on my phone. Yep. Um, okay, here we go. The reason why I'm here tonight is because I want to present that um, the last time time meeting that we had, we discussed um, the steps and the requirements to be able to get live closed captioning while we have new meetings, um, town council meeting, board of education meeting, any meetings that are now we are doing since the pandemic started. Yep. Um, <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that I think it's actually pointless that we actually have to go through all of those steps 
as the time you have capacity to do a meeting. And not only that, um, especially if we have more people that join us in the meetings in the future, and they're also deaf, but they're not aware of the steps in the meeting, and they're going to have to go through all the struggles and the frustration to figure it out. Bottom line is ridiculous. That's just straight out truth. Um, so basically, we need to be able to provide some type of translation, live code captioning. And if that's not available, there is a sign language interpreter that can be provided through a technology that we have um, funded to the deaf people who need to make phone calls. When I need to make a phone call, I have a technology where I have a sign language interpreter. And um, that can be provided as long as I inform the um, agency that I need an interpreter for the so and so day. And they will get the meeting ID number and everything. And they will be a part of the meeting and they will be translating everything to whoever needs it provided. Now, that is not funded by the state, that is something that we have to pay. We, as the town, I don't know, but that's something that the town has to figure out. Um, I also want to inform you that I have come around finding out there are more and more people in town who are deaf, hard of hearing, deaf, mute, doesn't matter, or who relies on closed captioning. I am actually surprised the amount of people that actually live in this town have explained the frustration and the point of view of what's been going on lately. Okay. You can go ahead if you like to. Jennifer, are you done? Or are you still talking? Um, I think I'm done, but I would also like to voice a few things. Uh, somebody, I'm sorry, my daughter's here. <laughs> um, I would also like to read a couple of statements that came from the people in town. If I can please have a couple of minutes for that. Go right ahead. Let me find it. Here I have somebody by the name Holly Bradwick. He, um, she has, she was a pre-kindergarten teacher to my daughter. And during that time, she has actually learned to accommodate, to take some sign language. She even asked me for some advice in sign language so she can provide better communication with me when it comes to my daughter. And this is her statement. She says, imagine not being able to understand or participate in everyday activities because of a disability. Now imagine that the people in charge of various events, political and otherwise, do not make small compromises to help you. That's devastating. Not having proper accommodations like closed captioning and or sign language interpreter for people that are deaf is like refusing to put ramps on multiple buildings, then inviting people that cannot walk to come in for the community meetings. I've worked with people with all kinds of disabilities. I've worked with people that are deaf, some that are blind, and some that have mobile trouble. I found that with little compassion, a little bit of understanding and very few minor adaptations to people I worked with were more comfortable and able to participate in everything from political meeting to working various jobs. So for the love of all people, make the accommodations necessary for your constitutions that are deaf. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer, Thank can you. I get your address, please? What was that? Can you repeat that, please? Your address? Oh, uh, 25 Canterbury Arms. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. Next, Mike. 
All right, just give me one second. Joe, uh, things jump around on me here. Joe, here's your invitation to unmute. Good evening, everyone. First of all, uh, thank you, Jennifer, for your comment. <clears throat> for the record, Joe Quaranta, 87 Boardman Road. I'm also here today to speak um, as in regards to the hearing impaired. And I think um, what I'd like to do after listening to Jessica um, is um, ask the town council to discuss this further. I think there's some uh, maybe some simple alterations we can make to uh, what you've already done. We're thankful for what you've done. Thank you. Um, th there's some, I think, simple um, simple changes that can be made. One of which is a way for people who are hard of hearing to communicate back to you in the form of a chat. Not everybody has um, the luxury that uh, Jennifer has with her daughter um, to be able to translate. And if we can somehow just turn on automatic closed captioning somehow, um, I know there's other platforms that may be a little bit easier, but it, it is a bit difficult for folks that aren't computer savvy. And, you know, for folks that come into a meeting, uh, mid meeting and, and want to be able to participate and have not seen the tutorial. The other thing I'd like to talk to you about is the community center. Um, I wanted to see if this uh, committee and, and the mayor at some point could address what the intermediate and long term plan is for the community center. <clears throat> we have a lot of resources in the community that, you know, I think uh, are able to come here. And there's, you know, still been this kind of underlying um, persona in the community that the community center um, may go away at some point. And so I know we had a committee that talked about um, uh, what the community center was going to be and, and what the long term plan was. And, and I don't know if that information ever uh, was relayed to to the public, but I would ask that in a, a future meeting that maybe the mayor and the town council could discuss that further and, and relay to us residents um, what the, the intermediate, intermediate and, and, and you know, long-term uh, plan is with the community center. And, and if it's something that um, is gonna be a staple of our community, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to see it occupied with, with resources, resources that we desperately need. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Joe. All right, that's the end of the list, Pete. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Katie. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we'll move to item number three. Uh, I move to approve our consent agenda items, which are item 3A, prior minutes, item B, the tax collector refund, and item C, which um, I'll just briefly read to you. This is all refers to Parks and Rec. Donations they've received $100 from Levine Paint and Auto Supply, $100 from Affordable Automotive. Uh, and they would like to thank both of those uh, merchants for their kind and generous donation. These were used for the uh, purchasing of lights and bows and garlands for the green. And they would like to request that these donations be put into their revenue account number 33510. Zero 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 four eight four zero zero, which is Parks and Rec Recreation Gift Fund, um, and again they would like to thank Levine and Affordable Automotive for their generosity. Second. Second. Who's second? Who's second of that? Tom. Any of us. Tom. Okay. Thank you. Any. We have a sec, a first and a second. Any comments on the motion? No. Nope. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Okay. Item four. Wait, wait, um, wait, oh, excuse sorry, me. Mary Jane. Go Mary ahead. Jane? Sorry. sorry to interrupt. Um, I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules to add a further discussion about um, the otter. Um, you know, closed captioning and what we can do to possibly make it better for people because I'm hearing complaints from senior citizens that just can't follow it. And it just seems to be a little too burdensome. So I think we should okay. have a discussion. So we have a motion to add item number nine to our okay. agenda to discuss that. Second. 
Second from Chris. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Mary Jane. Thank you. Okay. Item four, a uh, motion to approve the uh, request from uh, Zach Scholar, USMC, and Anthony and Tracy Morrissey uh, for Brian Cody's law. They're requesting to close Main Street, Bank Street, Railroad Street, Housatonic Avenue, Boardman Road, and Bennett Street on Sunday, August the 29th, 2021, from 7.45 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. for the Sergeant Zach Scholar's Run and Fun Festival for Overdose Awareness. This uh, has been approved by the uh, Traffic Authority. So we had a second from Walter. And Mike, could you open up the mics for Zach and for, I believe, uh, Tony's on the call too. Coach Tony is here. We are indeed. Uh, thank you very much uh, to everyone uh, here at the town council meeting. Uh, we very much appreciate you giving us a moment. Uh, we do have a special guest tonight. Uh, Sergeant Schooler is on the line. So I'm gonna defer to him and let him lead the charge here. Thank Sergeant? you, Tony. Zach? Good evening, all. Thank you to the Milford Town Council for giving me the floor for a moment to discuss what is truly a pivotal moment for our entire community. For those who don't know me, my name is Zachary Schooler. I'm a Sergeant in the United States Marine Corps, currently deployed out of state. But more importantly, I'm a graduate of New Milford High School class of 2015. I was raised in New Milford most of my life, and no matter where in the world I go, I will always consider it my hometown. And I genuinely believe it has the potential to be the greatest town in America. Please know that since graduating high school, far too many of my friends and classmates have lost their battle with substance use disorder. Far, far too many. For way too long, our beloved community has shed tears, felt unimaginable heartache, and ever lasting due to the loss of loved ones from this decades long epidemic. Although I was disappointed that it took as long as it did to gain traction, I'm excited at the prospect of flipping the script and working with everyone in the community on a day full of family fun, remembrance, and recovery advisory. I ask each of you to consider and then vote a resounding yes on our application to host a full day event on Sunday, August 29th, 2021. This event would include not only my 5K run for awareness, but also a wide variety of family fun activities, such as live musical performances, face painting, fun games for kids, as well as an art exhibit, recovery advisory panel led by subject matter experts, and so much more. This is an opportunity for New Milford to set the standard for all towns across the United States on how to truly be a recovery-friendly community. But more importantly, it demonstrates to our residents and that our entire community is behind them and here to help. I ask not only for your affirmative vote, but also your commitment to help us community event remains free to our guests. I believe we are starting to turn the corner in our battle against the opioid epidemic. I wanna personally thank Chief Sarito, Mr. Colmar, <clears throat> Mr. Baisley, and all of our first responders for their tireless work. I would also like to thank our hometown nonprofit volunteer groups such as Camilla's Cupboard, Helping for Heroes, Brian Cody's brothers and sisters, and so many others for their dedication, commitment to our beautiful town and their fight in the battle. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Again, I'm sincerely grateful for your vote and support of our mission, and I ask you all to please keep going. Any questions for the sergeant? Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. No, no service, questions. Sergeant. Yep. Just, yeah, thank you for your service, both where you're at and here back home, too. So. Thank you both for this. Tony, whole event. Did, you, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Um, I just want to say thank you uh, again to everyone for the consideration. Uh, Mr. Bass, thank you for your uh, guidance. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can work this out. I will say that there was a revision to the, uh, to the road closures that Ms. Francis pointed out in the beginning. Um, in a good way, uh, Mr. Ceruto and his team suggested using the same uh, path that we use for the moonlight run, um, which is going to make things a lot easier and, and cause a lot less congestion. So I'm happy to provide those details, uh, but we are truly looking forward to what will be an amazing day. And uh, and I and I thank Sergeant.
Field Schooler uh, for, for being here tonight. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Sergeant. And I also wanted to, uh, Pete, I also wanted to echo uh, the councilman and, uh, and everybody and thank uh, the Sergeant for his service. And I think this is an excellent idea. And uh, with this OPI uh, crisis, uh, it's important. So I thank him for his service as well. And uh, just for background for the uh, town council, this did get approved by the traffic authority and also Park and Recreation approved it at their last meeting as well. So we had a first and a second. Any other discussion on the motion? <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you Sergeant. Guys. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Item five, uh, we have a COVID update from Dr. Jeremy Levin, and he's here somewhere. There he is. Someone can unmute him. Mike? Good evening. Oh, oh good, thanks. Good, good evening, good. Dr. Levin. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'd like to report on four different things, but I'll make it short because we've got a long meeting. The first is uh, on some real world data, which is important to us all. That's from Scotland, but it's important. The second, uh, we there's been some questions raised about the j, &J vaccine and when that would be arriving. The third is about children. I know I've been several times asked about this. So I'd like to offer you some answers to that. And lastly, uh, how long does the, immuno does the immunity last? That's a, a third question, a fourth question. So just briefly, uh, we all know about 63 million doses have been passed out in the United States. That represents about 13% of our population. It's 19 out of 100 people. Connecticut's doing pretty well at this moment. Uh, we are up with nine other comp uh, nine of the other states who have got more than 16% of the population vaccinated. But that's just facts. The real, wo real world data is important, and that comes from Scotland. They've got a population in Scotland of 5.4 million. They've done about 1.1 million have been vaccinated. And uh, what is really interesting about this is between December and January, about 8,000 people were hospitalized. But what is stunning is only 59 of them had been, were hospitalized after vaccination. So that means of the million people vaccinated, 8,000 went to hospital and only 59 of those 8,000 were vaccinated. So let's just understand that that's a very significant impact. On the 80 year old and olders, there's an 81% reduction in hospitalization. So that, this is all, uh, this data tells us right here that beyond the trials that we've seen, you vaccinate the population, you really have an impact on people going to hospitals. That's great news. Second thing is J and J. A lot of you have asked, several of you have asked me actually, when's this coming? Well, we already have Moderna vaccine. We have uh, Pfizer vaccine, which is being distributed. AstraZeneca is still having to run a trial. On the 26th of February, J and J will submit its application to the FDA for emergency use. We expect very shortly thereafter, it's for them to start rolling out their doses. We anticipate fully that they're on track. There's been some noise in the press that they aren't. That's just not true. J&J &J is on track. They had said that by the end of the year, they would deliver a billion doses. But by June, they will have at least distributed 100 million. So they are doing exactly what they said. In addition to which, uh, the administration has purchased another 200 million doses from, J from Moderna and from, uh, from, uh, from Pfizer. So from a supply point of view, I think we're doing well. From a distribution, we're getting better at it. And bottom line is, I think, as I said to you, Mr. Mayor, that probably by the end of summer, we'd be seeing a real bending of the curve. We may already be seeing that curve bending, but in the population in general. With regard to children, and I know Mary Jane, you're probably gonna ask me this, and this is the one I've been, every time I come on, I really wanna be able to give you the data. So here's what I know. So let's, uh, so far, 
a quarter of the population in the United States fall into that age group. That means about 2% of them have, uh, have, have, uh, have been affected definitely, and 1% of those have actually died. So we have about, at this stage, we have about 200 children, 2 million children essentially have been affected and about 200 have died. So there's good and there's bad news. 200 kids have died and that's terrible, <coughs> but 2 million have been infected. So we know that they are much less affected than us. Now, how, how is, what does that mean in terms of clinical trials? It's actually sort of an interesting one. We know that Pfizer has 2,000 children that they've initiated a trial on. These are kids between the ages of 12 and 15, nobody younger. Yet. Moderna has got 12, a group of, of between the ages of 12 and 17. And I expect J&J &J to start the trials in children uh, three to four weeks after they finished, they get an emergency approval for adults and adolescents. Um, AstraZeneca, don't quite know yet, not very clear. They did some trials in Great Britain, and those appear to be on the ages 12 to 17. The interesting fact about these trials is, remember I started with this terrible death rate of which it, the 200 kids who died, that's terrible. However, the fact of the matter is the adults and adolescent trials were, were looking at severe cases. There don't appear to be many severe cases in children. So the clinical trials here will have to look at surrogate markers, markers that don't actually talk about how sick they are, but rather have they had an immune response? Do they have antibodies in their blood? So designing those trials will be different from those in adults and adolescents. And then the other thing about them is that the safety hurdle for them will have to be a lot higher than adults and adolescents. Because if you have such a low death rate, you've got to have a super safe vaccine. The good news about that is that with the real world evidence that we already had, as I say, for example, in Scotland, 1.1 million people in vaccinated, United States, a tremendous 63 million doses already distributed. If we can collect all that information about its safety, we'll be in good shape kids about the safety. So that's as much as I know today about children. I hope that gives you a little bit more information. And then some really interesting hints about how long, the last point is how long the immunity lasts. And there's been some significant studies now that show that if you've had COVID, it looks like that the immunity that you have lasts for more than eight months. So that's looking increasingly interesting. The studies are small. I think we need to wait until we have a much longer database and it's less important because no matter what, if you've been infected, the recommendation is have a vaccination now, no matter what, because we still don't know enough. But somebody asked me specifically, how long would you have immunity following infection? Well, it looks like uh, your memory of your T and B cells is pretty good. The antibodies go down, but your memory for the infection is good. That bodes extremely well for the vaccination. So we still don't know how long the vaccination gives you immunity for, but based on the fact that when you get the disease, it looks like from a small study, eight months later, you still got a good response, the vaccination should have the same. So just those four points, real world data is looking encouraging. We're, we look like the J&J &J, uh, doses uh, will be rolling out, assuming uh, emergency approval shortly on the 26th. And there's a lot more doses in the pipeline from the administration who just bought it. Children, still a little bit unknown, to be honest. We'll have to wait for that data. And if I had to guess, we won't be vaccinating children until about August is roughly my feeling. The implications of that, by the way, Mary Jane, is that I would encourage the administration, and I have said this to them on two counts. Number one, vulnerable children with other disorders should get the vaccination. And I've published a letter now with a number of the rare disease organizations to state that. 
And secondly, the teachers need to be vaccinated because they are more vulnerable than the children to, to disability from the infection. And lastly, some encouraging news about how long the vaccination and immunity will last. I'll stop then. Any questions for Dr. Levin? Chris? Hi, Dr. Levin. Thank you very much as always for updating us. Um, I have two questions. One, just kind of piggybacking on the children. You had informed us last meeting, it's important for everybody to get the vaccine uh, if for no other reason to keep uh, the virus from mutating. Uh, is there any data that suggests that the virus mutates more often, less often in children? No, no evidence whatsoever, Chris. None. Okay. The same story. It's actually, it's not only stop the mutation, it's actually that, that stop of that. So it, it's an interesting point you've just raised up. Somebody asked me, why would I bother getting vaccinated if I've had it before? And you just put your finger exactly on the point why. You don't want it to spread because if it spreads, then it mutates and then it could get bad for others as well. Great, thank you. And then one last thing, and this is regarding uh, pregnant women and the vaccine. Um, I've heard data that suggests that so far 20,000 pregnant women have had uh, the vaccine without any uh, side effects. And I think Pfizer is doing a study, launching a study, I think with 4,000 pregnant women. Um, any, any other data out there that uh, might, um, you know, uh, on, on where pregnant women might go to decide? Because uh, I think mm -hmm. it's a tricky decision for them. It's an important decision. You're quite right. So we have evidence from previous vaccination campaigns about this. So what do we know about pregnancy? In pregnancy, none of these vaccines can actually cross the placenta. They simply can't. So that's point one, we know that. What we also know is that when a mother develops antibodies, that those antibodies can actually pass into the baby so that those antibodies can then convey for a period of time some protection to the baby. What we don't know yet is whether or not sometimes mothers can contribute white cells, <clears throat> T cells, we don't know that. So, but all of this would indicate that in actual fact, vaccination should probably be positive for a pregnancy. There's nothing to indicate that it should be negative for a pregnancy. So that's, those are two separate points. Antibodies passing into the baby, it can't get across the uh, placenta. There is another myth, if I may, just for a minute, which is important to dispel. Somebody asked me the other day, does it cause infertility? And so that's related to pregnancy. So Chris, I just want to use the occasion to say, no, there's zero evidence that that's the case. It's a myth. I don't know why it's spread, but there's no evidence of vaccines, of any vaccine for that matter, causing infertility. Thank you very much. Appreciate the information. Mary Jane. Good evening, Dr. Levin. Thank you for coming on every couple of weeks to talk to us. It's very helpful for everybody and, and very reassuring in a lot of ways. Um, I am worried about, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about possibly a tsunami of cases coming in March. What are your thoughts about that? You know, because probably because of the UK variant. Um, you know, Mary Jane, I, if, if I may, it's, I, you, we can speculate about that, but I think the, the likelihood of a tsunami coming is dependent totally on our own behavior. Yeah. If we start feeling super happy and start partying and collecting and not behaving in the way that we should behave, then you could almost be assured that that will be the case. But you know what's really terrific is watching the way that people have responded uh, just using the simple, before any of us have had the vaccination, uh, we're already bending that curve. And that's by the behavior of individuals. So I think I, I acknowledge that in certain parts of the country, there may be a tsunami. I think that that's possible. We've seen that recall what happened earlier this year when nobody in many of the other states, unlike here, unlike New Milford, unlike Connecticut, unlike much of the East Coast, other states just simply ignored it and they got the tsunami. And that's as a direct result of the behaviors they chose to adopt. 
So in short, I think it's unlikely so long as we take the precautions that we are taking at the moment. I think particularly in schools, we have to take those precautions. Oh, did we lose you? Are you still there? I'm here. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm worried, you know, because um, I think in Connecticut now they're, you know, changing, you know, there can be wedding gatherings or big parties up to 200 people, which to me just seems, it just seems like too much too fast. And, um, you know, the indoor dining increasing and, you know, I mean, I get it. I understand what restaurants are going through, but um, I, I'm worried about these bigger venues that they're saying that there can be up to 200 people. To me, that sounds like, and you know, all those people are not going to be wearing, if it's a big wedding party, they're not going to be wearing masks. So I am concerned, you know, that. I think that's, that's your, your concern is shared by those who are sensible. And I think we should all take a personal responsibility for dealing with this. I, it doesn't matter whether you feel safe, it's how do people around you feel? And I think that that person, we've learned a lot about this disorder. The one thing we okay. do know is it doesn't spread if you're sensible. It's really, it's really clear. And the other thing is that if you choose to behave irresponsibly, you're not only endangering yourself, you're endangering your colleagues and friends and family. Mm. So I, but I do think, Mary Jane, you know, the, the bulk of people that I've met, particularly in New Milford, are super sensible. And mm. it doesn't matter, you know, once the mayor once said to me, we're on our own, we're gonna do this. <laughs> he was so right. I, if the if the if the rules come down that says you can have these groups of two hundred, well, that's that's just fine. That's a can do, but uh, you know, New Milford is is has a deep understanding of what it can and can't do, and is doing it in its own way. And I think it's doing it in a super sensible way. So, whatever somebody says, you can gather to two hundred and three hundred. I'd like to see that fall a heck of a lot more before I'm prepared to go to a wedding with two hundred. Just to be very clear, my own daughter's getting married, and I've said to her, wait until the end, wait until after summer, please. Right, good idea. Thank you very much. Any other questions, Doug? Uh, I have a couple. Thank you, Dr. Levin, again. Um, I, I guess I just heard that Connecticut, um, we're going to start March 1st for 55 to 64. Is that correct? Is that something you've heard as well? Yep. Yes. Okay. And my second question is that um, they were talking about that most Americans would be vaccinated by July 1st. Is that something that you've heard as well? Yes, it's interesting. That's also what I said. I think if we go back to what we said at the beginning in, in December when we started doing these reports, that's what I expected would be the case. It's looking exactly like that. There was some question, oh, this has been delayed to July. I, that was all when the administration said that there would now be supplies available to the entire American population by July. That is correct. It won't be that everybody's vaccinated, but the supplies will be there. Mm. So my, my last question is, because when people are getting vaccinated now, so there's that false sense of, of security. Um, so when everybody's vaccinated, and I, many people have asked this question, then what, then what happens? Is it, because Dr. Fauci said, well, we might have to wear masks into 2022. What is the process of after everybody's vaccinated, you might have some that didn't get the vaccination and we still might have it uh, going around. What's the process of when things end or is it a trickle effect to make carry on until next year? You know, the, the unfortunate fact is about 40% of people don't want to get vaccinated. That's the trouble. And it's those guys who are going to cause us the problem because we don't know yet. It's looking good. It's looking, what's looking good is that if you're getting the vaccination, the evidence is now beginning to come out that you won't be carrying the virus. It's not clear though. If 60% of the country is vaccinated and is not carrying the virus, and the other 40 are, you, you, your problem will be that you still haven't got herd immunity because we don't yet know with how long the vaccinated group will remain immune. So it's a complex sort of, you're trying to draw two, two groups, two vectors together. One, 
the guys who people who've been responsible and stopping the infection those are those who've been vaccinated and those who, who are wearing masks and those who are not and those who refuse to get vaccinated will actually carry that fact will carry the virus and then anybody who's in the vaccinated group who now slowly starts to become less uh, less immune could get it again so Dr. Fauci's comment here is really to try and encourage people to act responsibly. <clears throat> Even if they don't want to get vaccinated, please wear the mask. I think that's all it is. The other thing about this, Doug, I, I think is that we're gonna experience um, this thing coming back like this, uh, like waves. We've seen this with, I uh, like flu. But by the time it starts doing this, you and I and everybody else will have our annual flu shot, have our annual COVID shot. So that I'm not worried about that, but I am worried about the 40% who just say, we're not doing this. That's, that's irresponsible. So I'm curious on that last statement you made. So you think that this is gonna be an, uh, an annual vaccine for COVID as well as flu? I anticipate that's going to be the case. It won't, it's wow. un unlike, I don't know if you had measles vaccine, I did. and. It's given me lifelong protection. For the moment, these vaccines do not seem yet to give. We don't know if they give lifetime protection yet. So, if they, if this COVID virus behaves like the flu, a different variant that might get around the uh, the vaccine may occur. We haven't yet seen that, but one thing's for sure: the good news on that is that these mRNA vaccines can be developed so fast now and distributed so fast. When that does occur, it'll be a CVS visit. It won't be a, oh my gosh, this is a panic, we have to shut down. Mm. Well, thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you. Real pleasure. Any other questions for Dr. Levin? Thank you, Dr. Levin. Thank my you. pleasure, thank, thank you very much. You. Thank you. Okay, item six uh, is an update from Lisa Morrissey, our health director. LMA? Uh, yes, she's there. Okay. I think she's here. <clears throat> there she is. Uh, is she on as LMA? I right. will find out. I just sent you a request to unmute, Lisa, if that's you. <laughs> I think I did anyway. I did too. Okay. Well, if it's not Lisa, <laughs> she won't unmute or somebody else will start speaking. I thought that was her. I thought that was her. It's yes. not Lisa. There's, oh, well. No, it's not Lisa. Oh. It's not Lisa. Okay. All right. So let's, so let's move on to the Katie? Yep. Okay. So we have item number seven. Uh, I move to approve the following appointments. And that is Lisa Morrissey to the Blight Prevention Board from February 21st, 2021, indefinitely. Local emergency planning from 2022 of 2021, indefinitely. And the long-term recovery committee, the temporary committee from February 22nd, 2021 till April 25th, 2021. These all replace Mike Crespin as the health director position. Second. Second. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank okay. you. Item 7B, which is the uh, reappoint to, I move to approve the reappointment to the, uh, of our poet laureate, I'm sorry, the housing partnership uh, that would be just that would be appointments for housing partnership. Yeah, no. I see that. Yes. So let's go to 7B, which is to reappoint. I move to reappoint okay. our poet laureate. I'm sorry, I thought someone was speaking. I hear an echo. Uh, James Scrimjower from February 22nd, 2021 to February 21st of 2023. Second. Second. Thank you, Walt. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? 
Okay, Thank and you. then I will move the appointment to the housing partnership of Christopher Ludwig, Ludwig uh, from February 22nd, 2021 to January 31st of 2024. And Joseph Baker, the same February 22nd, 2021 through January 31st, 2024. That's the housing partnership. Second. Second. Any discussion? Mary Jane? So um, a couple of things, I'd like to make a couple comments on the housing partnership. Um, well, I am certainly not gonna oppose my two Democrats that are on my Democratic Town Committee. Um, I am disappointed again, as usual, that um, you know the names did not come from the Democratic Town Committee. And um, apparently they were not interviewed by you, Pete, individually. And they had no idea that they were being put on tonight. So there's a problem there that needs to be corrected. So, so I, I'm not opposed their uh, appointment, <clears throat> but um, in the future, it would be really nice if you have Democrats that you would at least um, give me the courtesy of a call and let me know. So Mary Jane, uh, kind of the history, they attended the housing <laughs> partnership committee meeting of which the chair asked both Mr. Baker and Mr. Lewitt if they'd like to be a part of the committee. At that particular time, they said they would. And as you know, being on the housing partnership as you were before, that some of these are uh, ones that are segmented to certain parts, like for a zoning person, a planning person. But I will make sure that we contact you prior to putting people on. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. And do we have any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Okay, mayor's remarks. Thank you, Katie. So as we do uh, before every meeting, we go over the COVID numbers as they appear from the state of Connecticut. As we always say, as kind of the caveat, these are numbers in totality since the beginning of last March. State of Connecticut is at 258,293. Litchfield County is at 10,013, which was up 78 from Friday. Hospitalizations are at six, which is down one from Friday. New Milford is at 1712, which is up nine from Friday. And as we ask all of our residents, if you're elderly or a person with an underlying condition, an example, diabetes, a pulmonary condition or heart condition, please only go out if you have to. If you're exhibiting any symptoms of COVID-19, Please do not go to work or send your child to school if you have symptoms. Please call your primary doctor and please get tested. And please check on your elderly family and friends. As we say uh, each uh, time we meet here as a council, if you could just call on 10 of your elderly family or friends, do, do a welfare check on them. It helps them, they'd love to hear from you, and it also helps uh, the community. COVID uh, update on vaccines. The governor today announced a schedule for age-based eligibility of vaccines. He's changed the uh, mark from phased uh, different parts of our society to age-based. And uh, over the next several months on March 1st, he's gonna expand the age group from 55 to 64. On March 22nd, he'll expand the age group to 45 to 54. On April 12th, he expanded the age group from 35 to 44. On May 3rd, he expands the group from 16 to 34. He also put a caveat to this. In addition to the age-based el eligibility, pre-K through 12 school staff and teachers and professional child care providers will be eligible to receive the vaccine in March at dedicated clinics that will be set up specifically for those sectors. Educators and child care professionals will soon receive information from their school administrators and employers on when their dedicated clinics will be provided. Also here in New Milford, we've set up, uh, we began to set up our own clinics. And if you're interested in being a volunteer, you can call 860-355-6059, or you can email to nmvolunteers at newmilford.org. We've had quite a response from, from volunteers here in the community to help us on our ongoing clinics, but we always need more people. So if you are a person that would love to help, we'd love to have you. Uh, COVID-19 for testing. Uh, we again are partnering with the state to offer free COVID testing at Pettibone on February 27th. 
from 3 to 7 p.m. This is in partner with, partnership with the state. And as we say, it's first come, first serve. Again, this is a free uh, event. I'd like to thank Debbie and Rachel, the founders of A Little Help from My Friends this past Saturday. Uh, they did a food drive for our social services team, DCF and other agencies. So thank you for doing that. It's always great when we have the community helping those in need. So thank you. Also I'd like to thank uh, our youth agency director, Jason O'Connor, our youth agency prevention manager, Brian Hembook, and as they are addressing uh, children's socialization, isolation, and remote learning through COVID-19. We're also working with our New Milford schools on this uh, project as well, and our park and rec team, and I'll have more information at our first March meeting on our efforts with that. Uh, also, uh, the um, youth agency, uh, in partnership with a, the New Milford Police Department, uh, tomorrow, is going to have uh, a webinar or a symposium on uh, teens and internet safety. So please check out the Youth Agency Facebook page. Uh, it's free to join and it's great information, especially as parents, especially as our children are much more on the internet uh, than they were prior to COVID. And there's always uh, room for uh, making sure that we keep our, child, our children safe, especially on the internet. Uh, youth basketball is starting up uh, with our park and rec teams on February 22nd. It's an eight week instructional program to introduce uh, fundamental basketball skills. Uh, it's a basic understanding. It's on Mondays from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. And it's ages eight to 10. This is a COVID compliant um, exercise. So thank you to Laura Murphy and the park and rec team for that. If you have any, any questions, you can contact park and rec for that. Library construction continues. The contractor continues with uh, steel fabrication. They're doing roof removal. And at the Goodman House, they're doing some continued framing demolition. Uh, as we talked about before, it's an 18 month project. Uh, it's right now currently on time and on budget. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank um, our contractor and uh, also like to thank, thank Steve Masquez, our clerk of the works as we continue to work forward. Also, we'll be presenting to the town council at our first or second uh, meeting, our partnership as we have done with NV5 and the school system. And this is what we uh, agreed, uh, 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 I believe last year. This is where we're looking at energy cost savings that will allow us to buy capital items for both the school and for the town. Uh, this is a great opportunity uh, that we're gonna be able to get capital items without uh, taxing the taxpayer additional funding. So we'll have more information on that uh, either at our first or second town council meeting. Uh, lastly, our budget process, uh, this uh, starting tomorrow, uh, we begin our budget uh, hearings, town council and board of finance jointly. So please uh, uh, tune in uh, if you're here at the public and what will happen is our department heads will present to the town council and board of finance. And they will be able to ask any questions. Because this is new as we're doing it virtually, we'll be sending out additional information to the town council and board of finance. We are asking our town council and board of finance members to log in 15 minutes early for the first couple of nights to make sure that we have everything set up for yourselves and for the public. And that'll do it, Katie. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, item eight. I move to allow the mayor permission to execute the Berkshire Owners Association Finance Agreement. Uh, Parks and Rec also will store the equipment in there in that facility. Second. Thank you, Walter. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Oh, Dave. Yeah, just really quickly, uh, the equipment that's uh, uh, stored there. I understand it's been there for years and is to protect it from the weather elements. Yes. How many items are we talking about, or do we know? Uh, there's uh, probably four lawnmowers there, big lawnmowers. Yeah. Uh, there's all their weed whackers, all their tools. Okay, so yeah, basically the outdoor maintenance equipment. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Katie, I see Lisa has just yes. logged in. Could we circle back with the approval of yes, the council indeed. for Lisa to give us an update? Absolutely. Certainly. 
Lisa, are you unmuted already? Hi, I'm unmuted. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi, everyone. So um, thank you so much for having me this evening. It is my pleasure to give you the COVID-19 update. Um, so I would like to start with the, the vaccine since I think that's the thing that everybody is most keenly interested in, if that's okay. Mm. Absolutely. So um, I'm very pleased to let everybody know that we were approved by the Connecticut Department of Public Health to be a COVID-19 provider. Um, and we have placed our first order of vaccines. It went in uh, last week. Uh, our first order was for 500 vaccines. And in lieu of the state's um, update today that they're expanding 1B to include all of the teachers starting on March 1st, as well as daycares and um, folks that are between 55 and 64. We actually reached back out to the state today to increase our vaccine request to 800 doses of vaccine for our first shipment. Um, it is our hope and our intention to have one Saturday and one evening every week that we'll have a vaccine clinic. Um, and we're continuing to look at the possibility of expanding that based upon the vaccine availability and staffing. Um, Katie Francis, who is on the call, um, is one of the people who is helping us with the volunteer coordination, as well as several other department heads um, within the town. Right now, um, we are moving full steam ahead. We have the equipment in place. Um, all of that has been submitted to the state. We're also partnering with New Milford Hospital in terms of looking at what staff that they can provide as far as staffing, which will really help us to expand our, our footprint in the vaccine distribution. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, if there are any questions about that, I can answer those before I tell you a little bit about um, testing numbers in the town. Mm. Chris? At least, yeah, thanks for, uh, for jumping on here. So a couple questions regarding the vaccine. So I, I, if we're going to be storing it here, so we're going to get the, I know at least one of them requires the ultra low temperatures to store. So we'll have the appropriate uh, equipment to, to keep it at temperature for a period of time. So we'll be actually receiving the Moderna vaccine, which doesn't require as low temperatures. Um, so that's the one we were initially approved for. We did talk to the state of our intention to also begin ordering Pfizer vaccine. We have the equipment um, ordered for the Pfizer vaccine, which is the ultra low temperature. Um, and that one is a little bit back ordered. So it's gonna be a couple of weeks before we order that. Once we receive that uh, freezer unit, our intention is to, to order both vaccines so that we have um, more than one option when the weekly distribution and allotments are, are calculated. Mm. Okay, and then a second question, and this is, I'm thinking a little more down the road when J&J &J is available. Um, certainly the efficacy, so that's a very different technology than the two mRNAs uh, that we have right. today. Uh, and the efficacy is different, lower for J&J. &J. Do you anticipate um, people might have the ability to request a certain vaccine? So at this time, um, people cannot request a vaccine, not just with our clinic, but you know, across the board here in Connecticut. Um, while the efficacies may vary across the vaccine, uh, across the vaccines, the one thing that does remain constant is that they all have proven to be very effective at reducing severe illness and death, which is the, the ultimate goal. I think that we'll probably see over the next several weeks and months more and more information about the efficacies as we see different um, strains of the virus coming into circulation. So as I've been telling residents when they, they call and talk to me, um, I, I'd rather people focus on getting the vaccine instead of worrying so much about which one that they're getting because um, by and by, you know, they all are proven to be very effective at reducing severe illness and death. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Lisa? Doug? Just one quick one. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, so you're saying we're going to get 500, possibly 800 requested. So can you give kind of us and the general public that are listening how they can apply to get that and uh, what's the process? Certainly. So thanks. Another great question. So um, first, let me just clarify. So what we requested isn't necessarily what we will receive. So you can request 500 and only get 10. Um, so. Um, our communication to the public really will be tailored based upon the number of vaccine doses that we do receive. If we don't receive enough that we could really open it up widely, then it's going to really um, 
truncate, if you will, our communication. So our communication strategy that we've been working on is to one, we're going to be updating the town website with information as to how you can get enrolled directly into VAM. Two, to really communicate with our seniors and our population that may have um, a difficulty using the online platform. So giving them a telephone option in addition to the state's telephone option that they have. So there'll be a local piece there. Um, and the senior center, I have to give the senior center and IT um, kudos because they really have been strong partners with us in um, getting people on the phone and talking to them and scheduling them. So we've really been making sure that we're building up our infrastructure so that once we do make the announcement through the town's residents that we have multiple platforms for them to to access uh, those appointments. Mm. Thank you. Lisa, Chris? I think, can I just say something? Lisa, I think that the overall thing that people need to know is that they do have to go through the VAM system. We can get them into it and if they need help doing that, but they do have to register through VAMS, correct? So um, most of our appointments will be available on VAMS, but we will be keeping a, a certain number of the appointments right. off of VAMS for the seniors and for other people who can't use VAMS. So they, they won't have to go through the stressors with that. Um, we'll but they'll it have to the reach end. out. They have Those people will need to reach out uh, to the health department or in whatever way we advertise by phone in other words, Correct. what I'm saying is you can't just walk in off the street. There are absolutely no walk-ins. So walk-ins are prohibited across the state. Mm. Thank you. Chris? Sorry, just one last question. And just to be clear from what I read, uh, the next phase, which are uh, educators and the, the age group of 55 to 64, you do not want them to register before March 1st. Is that correct? That is correct. So March 1st is the first day that they can begin their registration. Got it. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Lisa? Mary Jane? Well, I'd just like to say, Lisa, I will give you a call. Or Katie, you can sign me up for volunteering. For oh, good. Inject I think I already put you on there anyway, Mary Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I'm more than happy to do it. I am. I received my first vaccine uh, last Saturday, so I... I would like to wait until I get my second vaccine, which is like March 24th, and I'll be ready to go after that. So I'll I'll sign you up and and put you down for that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Very happy to have you. And you know, I I would encourage everyone to just let but get the word out there that we are still looking for people to help in those clinics um, and the call center. So you don't have to be a nurse or a doctor or a paramedic. Um, everyone is welcome. There, there's a role for everyone for volunteering. Any other questions for Lisa? Thank you, Lisa. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Lisa. Did you all want me to go through the testing a little bit as well, or we yes, just wanted please. to cover the short? Sure. So, um, I delivered the, the testing report um, earlier this week and um, last week as well. So what we've been seeing on, on average, we're averaging it in the mid-20s per day for the number of people that are getting tested. Uh, just before uh, the Super Bowl, uh, we had um, one of our highs for the last six weeks with 138 people tested. Um, and then it went right back down. And then after the, the Super Bowl, we saw a little bit of an increase of, of testing as well. And what that really looks like is that people who were going to be going to Super Bowl parties or gatherings um, were getting tested just before they went. And then um, the Monday and the Tuesday following the Super Bowl, we saw people who may have attended gatherings, they went for testing. So the overall messaging really is that, you know, the testing numbers are lower than we would like to see. Um, with only 20 some odd people getting tested typically on a day, I, I would like to see that number um, go up significantly. And we've been talking internally about strategies to really increase that number, including messaging and, and letting people know where they can get tested. I know that people have asked me, you know, where in New Milford they can get tested. So that speaks to the fact that we need to communicate better with the public as to that, that their testing is still available. Jim Furlow has done a really great job in making testing accessible. So we just have to, to push that messaging a little bit more. Um, second to that, um, similarly to the, the rest of the state, we are seeing um, declines in a number of cases, which is really encouraging. Um, and I'm anticipating that we'll probably see, we'll, we'll probably mirror the state for, for some time now. I think the, the key piece really, like I said, is to, to continue to encourage people to get tested um, and then to 
really hammer home the message that the vaccine does not negate the need for testing. Um, it does not negate the need for masking and it does not negate the need for social distancing. So really to keep up all of those strategies and to think of the vaccine as one more tool in the toolbox, as opposed to the cure-all for the, the things that we don't really find as comfortable. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Any further questions for Lisa? Thank you for the update, Lisa. Okay. Okay. Uh, we move to the item that we added, item nine. Uh, Mary Jane would like to discuss the closed before captions. We do that, oh. Before we do that, Kate, can we do the proclamations? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> they, I thought you weren't gonna do them. They were under your remarks. Um, if the uh, if Mike or Heather, Heather Mousen are on, could you raise your hands? So each, uh, Heather, as Mike, is yep, uh, Heather or Mike. I don't see them under that name. Yeah, I don't see either. Okay. So uh, every February, uh, we do, we, rate, we wear red for uh, awareness uh, for Julia's wings and the aplasty uh, anemia awareness week. So as we do uh, each February, uh, and we'll make sure we put this up uh, on our sites. Uh, whereas a, 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 a plastic anemia is a rare and serious disease where a person's bone marrow fails to make enough blood cells. And whereas a plastic anemia can appear at any age, in any race or gender with between 600 and 900 people in the United States being diagnosed each year. And whereas many people who have a plastic anemia can be successfully treated with prompt care with blood and marrow stem cell transplants offering a cure for some people with disease. And whereas individuals aplastic anemia often require specialized medical and support services to ensure their health and safety and to support families resilience as they manage the financial burdens that aplastic anemia can't present. Whereas the Julius Wings Foundation formed in honor of local resident, Julia Malson is now celebrating eight years of service to families affected by aplastic anemia and dedicate to providing funding for research, is spearheading and awareness efforts called Operation Wear Red. In order to educate parents, families, professionals, and the general public about aplastic anemia and its effects. Now, therefore, I, Pete Bass, Mayor of the Town of New Milford, to hereby proclaim March through April 7th, 2021, is Aplastic Anemia Awareness Week. And as we do uh, each and every year, uh, the flag, the uh, light poles, and the bandstand will be lit in red. So thank you to our Park and Rec team and our Public Works team uh, for doing that as well. And thank you for Julia's Wings for each and every year helping those with a plastic anemia. Uh, the next proclamation is uh, February is uh, preventing. It's Teen Violence and Awareness and Prevention Month, and some statistic. Statistics, nearly one in 11 female teens reported experienced physical dating violence in the last year. About one in 15 male teens reported experiencing physical dating violence in the last year. About one in nine females and one in 36 male high school students reported experiencing sexual dating violence in the last year. 26% of women and 15% of men experience intimate partner violence for the first time before the age of 18. I think it's very important as, as uh, those that are parents and those that are concerned about any kind of violence, uh, it's uh, definitely something that we need to create awareness to. So whereas females between the ages of 16 and 24 are more vulnerable to intimate partner violence, experiencing abuse at a rate almost triple the national average. And whereas one in three adolescent girls in the United States is a victim of physical, emotional, and verbal abuse from a dating partner, a figure that far exceeds victimization rates for other types of violence affecting youth. And whereas high school students who experience physical violence in a dating relationship are more likely to use drugs and alcohol, are at a greater risk of suicide, and are much more likely to carry patterns of abuse into the future relationships. And whereas young people victimized by a dating partner are more likely to engage in risky sexual behavior and unhealthy dieting behaviors and experience many 
disrupt normal development of self-esteem and body image. And whereas nearly half of teens who experience dating violence report that incidents of abuse took place in a school building or school grounds. And whereas only 33% of teens who are in an abusive relationship ever tell anyone about the abuse. And 81% of the parents surveyed either believe teen dating violence is not an issue or admit they do not know if it is one. And whereas by providing young people with education about healthy relationships and relationship skills, and by changing attitudes that support violence, we recognize that dating violence can be prevented. And whereas it is essential to raise community awareness and to provide training for teachers, counselors, and school staff so that they may recognize when youth are exhibiting signs of dating violence. And whereas the establishment of the Teen, teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month will benefit young people, their families, schools and communities, regardless of socioeconomic status, gender, sexual orientation or ethnicity. And whereas everyone has the right to a safe and healthy relationship and to be free from abuse. Now, therefore, I, Pete Bass Mayor of the Town of New Milford, do hereby uh, proclaim February 2021 Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month throughout the Town of New Milford uh, to work toward ending teen dating violence by empowering young people to develop healthier relationships, assisting victims in assessing the information and supportive services they need, creating better and more resources for young people in need, uh, in instituting effective intervention and prevention policies in schools and engaging in discussions with family members and peers to promote awareness and prevention of the quiet epidemic of teen dating violence. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Mayor. Now, item nine, uh, we added Mary Jane. You wanted to bring up the um, closed captioning. Right. Um, Jane? Um, it appears that um, the otter is just not working really well for a lot of people. Um, I'm hearing, you know, you all heard Jennifer Rose on here and um, I'm hearing for some older people that they just can't follow the whole program, that it's just too confusing. And um, I did talk to, I think his name is Brandon from the Board of Ed, who does their IT or Brendan, I'm not sure. Um, and they use, um, it's on Zoom, but they use Rev and the closed captioning is right there. Nobody has to go through this whole process of touch this to go here, go there, go back here. It's just, it's just too complicated. I just think we well, need to make this easier. Um, for I will every say time. one thing, Mary Jane, it's not difficult if you click at the top of your screen, you click once and you view the stream and you actually go there. But I will say this, it is, it does move at the speed of the person who is speaking. Also, we don't all identify ourselves when we start speaking. So you really would be stuck not knowing who was speaking, but it's very well, fast if you're a fast talker. So I don't know Rev, it might be better, but I mean, it is easy to get to it. You just click once, you don't have to do anything I, else. People are not happy with it, uh, I'm telling you. So I, I think, you know, the bottom line is I think we all wanna make this easy. Yeah. For people. I mean, yeah. they already have a handicap and right. we don't I was it, wondering if, uh, you know? I, I was wondering if looking at, I don't, I know about Otter, but I don't know if it's possible to slow it down or, you know, if you say that the clicking on it is, is a problem, then what do you do with Rev? Does it just come up? It does. It comes, it just comes up. It's Where, closed. It comes up right up under your screen. And like when, but like if I was looking at you and you were speaking, I would see it under your face. But it's so tiny. That's the thing. Um, we'd have to make sure people understood about how to well, use Well, I think view, it's right? worth talking to the Board of Ed IT sure. to see exactly, you know. Oh, I agree 100%. You know, I, yeah. it's, I just think we need to make it easier for everybody all the way around. So who's going to sure. discuss this? You, you want to talk to them? You want us yeah, you want so we'll to talk? So what we'll do, Kays, we'll have uh, our IT uh, talk to the Board of Ed IT if it's a simple fix of moving mm -hmm. over to a different platform if it makes it easier for someone. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. I, I was going to say, we're not the only ones dealing with this issue. And I'm sure there's more than two platforms out there. Right. So, but this uh, Rev, if it's part of Zoom, sure. I know that they yeah. have one. I have yeah. a friend who's deaf and, um, I, and you know, everybody's got their capability and their certain levels. And certainly we want to make it so that it's easy. And I agree watching Otter 
can be very confusing because you don't know who's Okay, so why don't we why don't we see what's out there? As I said, yeah. there may okay. be probably more than one platform, and some might be Zoom compatible. We and don't. Maybe know. we could ask Jennifer, Pete, if the if it's something we can do. Why don't we ask Jennifer, let her see it, or ha ask her if she would mm -hmm. try it and see how it is. Absolutely. And the the other part of the equation is that um, you know they they need to be able to um, participate in chat. You know, which which you know like. Mike would um, control that part, you know, like obviously you can't just jump in and start talking to everybody. But, you know, if sometimes we ask people, you know, during our uh, meetings to kind of, you know, talk to us or tell us something that we need, some information that we need, and certainly that could be enabled through chat. So, I mean, that's definitely important that they are able to actually do that if they're called on to do that or you know, whatever. So it, that, it's not a big deal. You just, you know, obviously. No, I don't people. think, right. Come off. That's so. great. Well, I think, and I think we should ask Jennifer and, and um, uh, there's another person I know in town that I don't know that she watches us, but we should ask a couple people to see, you know, what they yeah. say and if they have thoughts on it too. It's a great idea. I agree. Yeah. Otter is very, it's very fast to follow a senior, you know, real, a senior who mm -hmm. had a, an issue might definitely not like it at all. Chris? Yeah, and I would just reiterate that was Katie. You, you touched upon what I was going to say. It's uh, if we have another option or another couple options. To me, it's key to get the people who we're trying to benefit get their feedback before we launch anything else, because none of us uh, sitting here can really understand uh, what it's like. So I think we definitely need uh, their feedback. Uh, Beach, that when you speak, Chris, it's very easy to follow. When I speak, it's fast. <laughs> it's, it's no, it's it's not it's not something that you would want to do for a regular for a two hour meeting. Yeah. So we'll have uh, we'll have okay. we'll see if they're like Dave was saying. There's some different platforms. We'll see which one works best, and Katie will work with uh, Jennifer and your friend, and we'll see which one is the best for for Great. everyone. And, and the only other thing I'll say, Mary Jane, about the chat, I understand what you're saying, but I think we have to be really careful. Uh, cause there have been these zoom type of zoom. Oh meetings yeah, exactly. Where I, I the chat, totally get that. Yeah, right. So that's, as that's, long as we can control it. Right. And you can control it. Yeah. So just like now. Yeah. Controllable. So great. Well, we'll learn all about it. And Mary Jane, do you want to be in a, do you want to be a clinician for the vaccine clinics or you just want to, do you want to give the shots? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, with me. good. March 24th. All right, that's my day of my second shot. So no, I'm only kidding. <laughs> we won't sign you up for that day. I'll send you the email so you know. Okay. Everything. And anybody else who's listening to this, if you want to volunteer, please uh, call or email. Walter? If there's nothing else, a motion to adjourn. Second. second. Any discussion? All those in favor? All right. Aye. 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 everybody. Good night, 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 everybody. Good night,